Hey out there fellow YouTubers and sim race drivers. I made this video to explain why I built the racing simulator the way I did. Uh, I hesitate to even call it a simulator. I like to call it the simulator sled because it's not just for racing. It's meant for flight simulators, space, anything that I could possibly attach to the thing. It's part of the reason why I designed it the way I did. Uh, this video goes into those details. Now I know a lot of you have asked for blueprints and I want to apologize first for not delivering them as I said I would. I will be giving them out for free. I do not intend to charge money for them or build parts for anybody. Some of you asked about costs. Uh, we had some pretty clear goals in mind, uh, predominantly everything under a thousand bucks. Now the cost did include the wood, all the raw material in terms of metal, the racing seat, the hardware for the seat, any miscellaneous bolts and nuts and screws, all the paint and glue, the wiring, the carpet, and even the amp and audio hardware that went into it. The cost did not include the computer or computer hardware. I did look at using a projected curb display and made a design accordingly, but what I found was that using three monitors of 27 inches sufficiently covers the peripheral vision to give the illusion of speed. Therefore, I decided not to go with uh, a curb display or projected display. Again, all these things will be detailed in this video. Uh, but this video is really meant to give you an assist in terms of your own design. Before I set out to build my own rig, I looked at a slew of different commercial rigs. I also owned a play seat and had fiddled around with modifying the play seat for different purposes and had used that for quite some time. Uh, they're all perfectly good. Some of them are really nice. Uh, again, there was always something with them, some particular aspect that I couldn't adjust. The pitch of a wheel, uh, the fact that I couldn't hold three monitors suspended as part of the rig itself. Uh, various types of things like that that bothered me. In the end, I designed uh, various types of all aluminum chassis. Uh, and again, I was going after some of the features that I wanted, single throw levers for the steering wheel. But all of these options ended up looking very expensive when I started totaling up the cost of the aluminum and more importantly, the cost and the difficulty in assembling something like that. Ultimately, I wanted a seating position that was somewhere between a regular car seated position and a Formula One. I didn't want to be quite as laid back as a Formula One, something more akin to sitting in a comfortable chair with my feet up on an ottoman. And that's partially what drove this design. I went with a fixed back seat simply because it's very easy to bolt up. It allowed me to have the type of rigidity and adjustability I need without the bulk and the overall expense of a reclining chair. By using a simple fixed back seat with a fixed base that pitches zero to 30 degrees, I was able to easily bolt up transducers or you could use speakers to send uh, vibrations through to the seat easily. For the computer, we used a fairly current Intel processor setup with uh, twin video cards from NVIDIA and an SLI configuration. Those two video cards can drive the three monitors quite handily at uh, over 60 frames a second with all options up. We also added a 1000 watt power supply for future expansion in case we want to go to three or four video cards and we use liquid cooling to help cut down on the sound in the uh, system. Of course, we boot with an SSD and we have a two terabyte data drive. Now because the wheel system was designed with a plate to be swapped out for different types of wheels, uh, we can have just about anything we want on there. We'll talk a little bit more about this setup later in the video. Okay, the materials used were pretty straightforward. MDF because it's easy to work with and finish, steel because it's easy to weld, and we used an oil-based paint and automotive clear coats to finish the base unit. We used an automotive spray paint and primer for the steel components. We used trunk carpet, which is fairly thin and pliable, and spray adhesive uh, for all the carpeting. And we used pine and plywood for all the internal framing structures. We used structural steel because it's strong, cheap, and it's easy to weld. Now in the end, I had to pay someone to TIG weld it because I couldn't get the types of seams that I liked with my small MIG welder. If you have a good welder, I shouldn't have a problem. An alternative is to use T-slot. With T-slot, in theory, you could cut this and essentially assemble the same type of a frame and preclude the need to weld anything. I don't have any personal experience with it, but it looks like it would work. When working with MDF, you want to make sure that you have very clean and straight lines. I bought uh, 
this 2x4 here, which is a finished grade 2x4 to make accurate cuts. We use backer boards to screw in uh, directly to the MDF. And remember, you can't screw into the side of MDF. So we use a skeletal structure using strips of pine wood that are 3 quarter inch square and we glue and screw to that. This ends up making a structure that is cross braced and exceptionally strong and will not flex over time. We had a lot of planning goals in mind for this rig when we designed it. Uh, first and foremost, our platform had to be strong. Uh, secondarily, it had to provide a seat that would allow for tactile feedback and our monitor rack needed to be fully movable up and down and front and back. Our steering rack had to act like a steering rack in a car and our pedals had to be fully adjustable for any kind of pedal system. When we look at the structure of the rig, it's set up in such a way that pretty much every aspect can be moved. Uh, so when we start looking at the, you know, the seat and the pedals, both, since both can move forward, we can close the gap or really broaden the gap. Similarly, the monitors can be brought forward and back or up and down to adjust line of sight, and the steering wheel can be moved forward, back, and tilted to adjust whatever angle we need. Specifically now, let's look at the seat base and the pedal base and how that sets up and why we did it the way we did. As I said, I had a play seat and what I noticed is with the kids and adults, uh, the range uh, from the pedal to the seat has to be fairly close. So by using a universal bracket and a simple wooden base, I could attach speakers or in my case pucks to it to send vibrations through the seat and also make the tilt fairly broad ranged. As you can see in this example, um, moving the seat forward to its fullest extent already, I've got it very close to the pedals, so 12, 13 year old could use it. But if I slid this up, I could get it so short that even a five year old could reach those pedals. Now the pedals themselves are bolted to a primary board, which is then Velcroed to the tilting board, which allows us to swap out the pedal systems easily. The actual tilting mechanism is using standoff pegs, which are just bolts and grommets at five degree increments. The slot is about 10 inches long and that's what gives us the forward and back adjustment simply by loosening a single uh, clamp and sliding the pedal system forward back on guides. Now here you can see a typical space setup that I would have for say a 12 or 13 year old. Uh, it's fairly close together but it's still fairly roomy in between there. Now with the steering wheel removed and the steering uh, rack all the way forward and the seat pulled all the way back we actually have a nice bit of uh, foot room there so we can stand up and step out or makes it easier basically to get in and out. Okay, this brings us to the steering rack. Now the steering rack has to have four separate axes of adjustment. We'll get into each one of those independently. Now the first axis of adjustment has to do with the pitch and the rake of the steering rack itself. By adjusting the position in the rear, we can control the front position in terms of the height. Combined with the actual telescoping component and the height adjustment in the front, we can raise or lower the wheel up to 12 inches. Now the telescoping adjustment and the height adjustment in the front uses a positive engagement mechanism and a bushing type pinching system that essentially goes through the outer tube and pinches the inner tube to hold the telescoping at the position desired. Here I'm demonstrating how this works. Essentially you release one clamp. The steering uh, mount then telescopes towards you up to, I think it's 18 or 20 inches. Essentially, you can bring the steering wheel just about back to your chest with the seat almost all the way back. Now, once you have the steering wheel in place, again, a single clamp will hold it, and you'll notice that it's extremely strong vertically. Uh, you could put uh, a lot of weight on this, and it simply is not going to move. Now here you can see with the Formula One wheel, it's a very comfortable layout, uh, it's a very ergonomic layout, and it's also infinitely flexible for different wheels and different types of seating positions. Now the last axis has to do with the actual tilt of the steering wheel itself. We used a uh, bolt originally as a positive stop and eventually replaced that with a thumb wheel. But this allows us to switch between an automotive wheel, which would typically be tilted back, and a Formula One wheel, for example, that would be more perpendicular to the ground. Now all these features are great, but at the end of the day, uh, if it's not easy to get into and out of, it's going to be a pain in the neck to use. So we made this so that once you throw this uh, steering rack all the way back out of the way, it's essentially like getting in and out of a typical sports car. Uh, I won't say that it's entirely easy because it is a lot like uh, falling into a tub, like a Corvette, but it's no more difficult than that either. 
Now, I'm going to give you an example of getting into it and setting it up uh, from scratch, as I would in a typical racing session. So essentially what we do is we get into the seat and we just pull the wheel out and adjust it uh, very again, very much like you would in your car, single throw lever and clamp there to hold it all in place. Um, we then uh, take, in this case, because we're using the Fanatec Club Sport wheel, whichever wheel we want and clamp it on. And because I'm using a BMW wheel, I want it tilted up so I can see the gauges. And then it's just a simple matter of sliding up my seat and latching it into place and I'm ready to go, just like in a real car. So now let's put it all together with a couple of different driving sim examples to give you an idea how well this works. Well, I'm happy to say that I finally got around to uploading the blueprints that I do have to my website. So feel free to grab them and use them for your own DIY rig. As always, feel free to post your questions and I will do my best to answer them as quickly as possible. Thanks for watching, everyone.